Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Building an MVP Team, where we kind of take the approach of minimum viable product for your product and think of it as how you build an effective team. My name is Michael Peck, and I'm the founder and partner at a small consulting firm called Catalyst Community. I want to start this webinar by just basically starting with thank you. Um, I do find the community of product school a very important one. I think it's really meaningful that a lot of people work so hard to provide mentorship, to educate each other, to learn from each other um, about product management practices. And so thank you for being here today and being an active community um, that I've also benefited a lot from. So quick about me, um, I'm an anthropologist by education, um, but I spent the first half of my career more in consulting with experience in industries of tech, finance, retail, healthcare, life sciences, a broad set um, of different industries. And I moved into more internal roles of product management um, at Salesforce, uh, as well as Adyen for the last two for about five, six years. And I live part-time now in Japan and part-time in the United States, in Chicago and Northwest Indiana, um, working on the business that I started but I spent the three years before that in the Netherlands working at uh, payment service provider, Adyen, a fintech company. And then for eight years before that in San Francisco Bay Area, various companies. And um, that diversity in location and the experiences that I've had has really been helpful in product management. And I'm sure that resonates with others here watching the webinar. Um, it's really about understanding people, people and their backgrounds. And, you know, customers are people at the end of the day. And we're really trying to understand what incentivizes them, what makes them tick, and uh, what they'll really be satisfied with. So um, I guess even though it's just about me, I would say uh, a quick bonus learning before I start the other content is just really do understand how much life and the diversity of experience in your life can really be pulled into product management and being a good product manager because at the end of the day, yeah, we're all people and it's a very um, people and soft-skilled side of product management that I, I really find enjoyable, even though it's, of course, a very technical and hard-skilled um, type of role. So what will you take away from this session? I mean, it's really a conversation about being a good product leader. And part of being a good product leader is thinking a little bit different than maybe an individual contributor product management role. Um, but really, leadership comes in all sorts of ways. So one thing might be uh, you are an IC and you're a product manager, but you really do want to take some of these leadership qualities with you um, and affect the organization in a, in a new way. So I would say just take away the, the, the mentality of being a leader in product management and understand what that means is what I hope um, people can get out of this. So the first point I would have is about flexibility. Be very flexible in what your role is. Product management is already can be quite a fluid, ambiguous type of role. And the activities that you conduct as a product manager can be varied depending on you know, your experience and, and what organization you're in. But even more, sh more so as a leader, um, you really need to be flexible in the way you carry out your role. And so I hope I can tell you a little bit about what flexibility in that role looks like and how to be effective there. Second would be to really focus on the relationship between your resourcing, uh, because as, as a product leader, oftentimes you'll have teams and you'll have hiring needs and you'll need to grow uh, with the organization. And how do you grow? It's really a great way to align your product roadmap to your resourcing needs and understand that there's power in that alignment. And three, I would really like to see product leaders lead the conversation of product uh, and beyond operational excellence. So what that means is really focusing on operations and processes and ways of working and as a product leader, if you focus there, then it can really change the outcomes of not just the products and the features you deliver, but also the day-to-day -day happiness, satisfaction, and effectiveness of, of the teams and your constituency. Um, I would like to see more product managers 
think about operations and think about processes um, that affect their team and the greater team. So let's talk a little bit about that role of a PM leader. So what well, flexibility was the word I used before, um, but that's really a dynamic of how you work, but why, right? And the why is really product management leaders, by the time you've been in that role for some time, you, you start to realize that above all else, chasing impact is the thing you should be pursuing. Impact to the business, impact to your customer base, positive impact, of course. Um, and I say here above building an army, mainly because as a leader and as a manager, you're often, especially in some corporate environments, you really have a lot of pressure to grow and change based on hiring, quantity. Um, and in product management, I'm not sure if that's always the right approach, mainly because what people consider within your team is often product management as a function, whereas what you need for a fully functioning product team uh, can often not have even the title product manager or associate product manager or product owner, whatever. And so really focus on the impact of your resourcing and more than building a team uh, uh, in a quantity sense. And so part of doing that is really to empower other leaders to take charges in various spaces because we all know from being product managers <clears throat> that influence is everything. And the reason influence is everything is because you truly don't expect to have people management type ownership over a lot of groups and people that you need to rely on every day and that also rely on you. And so the best way to actually chase impact and make positive impact is to really empower other leaders and create a network of change agents um, that are typically outside of your space but have a direct effect on how you work. And third and finally, I would say um, as a PM leader, you really need to be a person that is good at identifying gaps and define process and role solutions. So this goes back to the point of how product managers really focus on the product and the features that they deliver. And they're really good at thinking, for example, around gap analysis. Um, but it falls a little short when it comes to resourcing and when it comes to processes. So I would say as a PM leader, be very conscious of the fact that the skill set that you already have today is very suitable in more organizational change than you might know. And I, I speak from an angle that um, I found it very natural to move from consulting into product management. But I also found that many product management peers of mine found it way less natural to go and advocate for changes around the organization and how others worked. And it can be a bit awkward at times, don't get me wrong, to tell people that maybe there are better ways to do things. But we do need to realize, especially in the PM role, given the nature that we have so much to own and so many people to rely on, but yet we cannot directly affect them, maybe from a more hierarchical sense, that you really do need to advocate for change in process and understand all the various roles outside of your direct PM team that affect that PM team. So you might see a theme here where, where these are very related to each other, but that's, that's the point, is really as a PM leader, you need to take a broader view and understand really what leads to successful teams and product. So where could you start? You know, that might be where you ask yourself from a little bit more of a tactical sense. Well, um, I have three categories here that I think could really help if you keep these in mind. One is just always think about showing how it's done. Um, and when I say, where do I start? Let's think for a second that maybe you have a new opportunity, you just joined a new role, or you just became a leader of a product team, maybe a group PM from a, from um, more of a senior product manager role or something like that. Um, these are places that I would say within the first few months to really dig in and um, focus on these as categories uh, of activities. So show how it's done. What does that mean? Well, really uh, don't make the assumption that everyone even knows what a, a well-oiled functioning product team looks like. Even the words product team together, to me, kind of fall short because we're really talking about, you know, no matter how you deliver, whether it's in an agile fashion or you have more of a traditional project management type of mentality at your business, the point is, is product management is really principled around um, 
software and development, and then it's gone beyond, right, into hardware and other things. So really when product managers talk, they're thinking about scrum teams, they're thinking about development, they're thinking about feature enhancements, they're thinking about a lot of these things that um, other teams aren't thinking about. So what does product management team and a fully functioning team look like to you? Is it um, a cross-functional scrum team that is all dedicated and focused to the outcomes that you have? Um, is it something entirely different? Don't take that for granted and really be the person that needs to explain to everybody what the functions are um, that make things that you're trying to deliver work. Um, the way I would start with that is with workshops. Uh, conduct workshops where you actually go through the artifacts, deliverables, and documented examples from your past that represent it being done well. Um, you need to come to the table with those examples and then have everybody practice doing this. And I would say that it's most important that you have that group be a wide range of people that might not even have to be doing it daily. So for example, user stories and a good user story, um, writing, you know, who's the actual benefactor from what is being created? How are you going to validate that what is created was actually created that you know, the way to expectation, so your acceptance criteria, whatever. A very well uh, articulated user story is really fun for people um, that are even the internal customer or stakeholder for that feature to understand the thought process that goes into a good user story. And it helps others understand also then what maybe a product manager is looking at a lot. Um, and then you can go on and follow that line of inquiry to things like, um, your quality engineering and your testing. Uh, how, how do you validate the outcomes of a release or, you know, that the product or feature has gone live? And that validation, that protocol that you have, whether it be a set like a test suite or um, a set of scenarios or manual testing or automated testing, um, what does that actually look like? Show those deliverables, show those outcomes and talk about them as a team. What is a a uh, wireframe supposed to do? What is a wireframe not supposed to do? How is it different than a product design document? You know, what are these annotations about interactive elements and functionality versus the styles and the brand and the, the front end uh, aspects of it? These are all things that you take for granted and then assume because you talk in, about it every day. But um, nobody really is talking exactly the same language until everyone's brought them. So show how it's done, um, humble yourself a bit, and instead of just trying to delegate the work to the right roles in the beginning, show everyone that you can actually, at least from a basic standpoint, um, provide exemplar pieces of that collateral and those outcomes uh, across the teams. And then um, you'll be more equipped to help empower others. And again, to be more tactical with what empower others could be, um, one thing I like to do is select a milestone or an early project that you want it to be the example of ways of working um, of a fully functional product team. And that could involve bringing a lot of people that just seem to be very interested or want things to get done into the fold and kind of separate and abstract them from their position in the organization and whatever maybe their role description says they are on the daily and um, give them the opportunity and have a discussion about, hey, for this project, for this milestone that we're going to try to, for example, make this major change or this redesign, we're all going to work together as a team. And there are roles per this functional you know, workshop set that we did. We all know that these things need to be done, jobs to be done, right? That's a very product management way of talking. There are jobs to be done. These are the people we have at our disposal. Who wants to do which jobs? And let people lean into jobs that might not even be completely aligned with what they've been doing uh, outside of this kind of vacuum of an experience. Um, the benefit of starting this way is twofold. Well, I mean, one is that you kind of get to be very risky and what could feel a little contra um, without a lot of risk that is really tangibly there because people are th thinking this is very temporary like almost a fun, special moment for people to do this thing. And if you can get the commitment from, let's say, their leadership and management, so I'm talking about, for example, maybe people that live in the design work or maybe data scientists and other teams, things that really roles that you're going to want to be affecting your team in a positive way. 
but it might be really hard to get full dedication and commitment and really sell that they should be part of the team in your hiring plans or, or even the alignment. So what you'd want to do there is um, really communicate along the way, the, the course and the project, how those roles and responsibilities are, are making this team so successful and how actually a team operating in this fashion just totally kicks butt. It's just doing everything that we need to really get real work done and out and deliver. And a fun thing happens there is that it creates this foundation for you to have this third piece of being an organization changer for you to really bring more of a data or at least you have some uh, explicit examples of why certain roles really need to be in alignment for you to get more of this good stuff. This project was so successful. Look at how we were. Look at uh, how everyone was functioning. How great was that? Now, we kind of compare that to what we really had today. We've got two PMs and one dedicated developer and nothing else. And so if we want more of that, man, are we falling short? So then you can start to really advocate for roles to be more and more aligned with your product or feature set and start to develop your resourcing plan around something that people can tangibly see. And so when you're trying to be an organization changer, this might not be comfortable for you as a PM because you're really used to influencing maybe existing roles to help you get things to the finish line. But you might not be very versed in writing job descriptions and imagining what organizational charts could look like, whether that be creating new dotted lines from disparate groups that show commitment and direction towards your product team, or whether it be saying, hey, there are some functions and roles that those workshops showed are probably you know, uh, good for a good team to have. And we saw them actually come to light during our exemplar project and look at how successful that was. Um, I'd be happy to bring those people on board so we could do more of that type of work. Now, this is challenging for you as a product manager uh, by trade because you might be doing, for my example, in a digital team is managing engineers. You know, I, I manage four or five engineers for a long duration of time before we could really get the technical leadership, get someone within that to step up to then say, hey, let's have an engineering you know, function within this part of the, the department um, as an equal partner with this product leader um, rather than a subordinate or, or a people management relationship. And of course, it's much healthier and better as it grows to have a technical lead and an engineering team that can equally spar with product rather than ever feeling like there's a conflict of interest to that technical pushback. But it's better than nothing to start. And you might be one of the most technical people in that you know, sphere of, of the organization. And that's what happened with me. This will also happen with things that are a little bit more on the bleeding edge, like experimentation or maybe, you know, with machine learning and AI. There's, these are teams where maybe you really want to dabble in that area, but the functional roles around the business really aren't developed enough. So how can you have those people on board if, you know, your title and your team doesn't really doesn't really match? Well, that's what those first two parts really help with, is it shows that a team kind of rallies around the jobs to be done and there are certain work products that are just necessary for the cool stuff that you're trying to deliver and so you're always there kind of as an open person to say things can kind of be i'll be a vehicle for some of these new roles because i know how to i know how to um channel that energy through good projects and releases and of course sky's the limit on where they can end up and you can start talking about you know, for example, with experimentation, it's really best to have a team that is really good at transcending product lines in different places and having a core, maybe centralized experimentation team that could be maybe a year and a half down the horizon. And you could see and tell people what that looks like then and how it could look like now living closer to your team because you're such a superstar product leader that you can also manage functions that might you might not be even the most skilled at. So again, this might be a bit provocative. I don't, I'm not sure if everyone would agree with me on that. Um, but in the past, I've been very open to bringing in functions that are, that are a little bit outside of product management, but are so necessary as partners or different 
roles for a product manager um, that you kind of need to be the leading um, person for it, or you might be waiting for a long time to get roles that are important for you. And this is a way to maybe uh, to maybe get yourself on track to have that conversation, which is challenging. If you start with being an org changer without really showing how it's done or empowering others, then I think you don't have a lot of foundation to have those conversations and it can be kind of chaotic and then more risky. So just be mindful of that. So let's talk a little bit about the resourcing roadmap. So <clears throat> when I say resourcing roadmap, hopefully everyone just thinks of a product roadmap and that's what I'm getting at is really to roadmap your resourcing and the hiring and put context to the roles that are necessary. So to that previous slide, what would a full functioning team look like? What could they deliver and how, what would their R and R, their roles responsibilities be? And then, you know, what is the organization that might support them? Well, now for a second say, look, this is where the whole organization wants my product line or my space to go. Here's a view that everybody has now been aligned with the story. So that's kind of prerequisite to this is having everyone feel really, um, involved and feel very adoptive of the arc of your story for where the the product is going and you can kind of use that to your advantage say okay so everyone agrees the product should be going this way and we want to be at this visionary place down the road if that's the case then in that same view like in situ here are the resources that are going to make this a success so it gives your resources a home that isn't a place that everybody is looking at, an evergreen, always living document that people already should feel um, very spiritually aligned with. And so it's not this separate thing of just a backlog of resourcing needs or this conversation that happens on the side. And so that's really important. And what's great too is that because that transparency that you have with the product roadmap, that transparency leads to also uh, being revelatory towards resourcing needs that are outside of your team. So back to the idea of being comfortable talking about roles and being very open to wherever they could live, it really, again, adds to that objectivity of everyone agrees with the vision of the product. These are the resources that would make that successful, as we've shown. Now look at these gaps that expose maybe other teams' gaps that could be a little bit spicier to talk about um, outside of the context of the product roadmap. But again, it, product roadmaps have a really um, great role in making people feel open um, to challenges and open to gaps and uh, opportunities. And so it really might reveal needs outside of the PM role. And then finally, it provides an advantage to recruitment. Um, recruitment as in a function like recruiters that you might work with but also just the activities that you'll participate in. So we'll look at that a little bit as well. Okay, so maybe here's an example of a digital team that might have had a couple categories of work. Here are some themes um, from left to right. It, it's temporal in this way. Like think of it as a roadmap. Um, where did they want to focus? What were they trying to succeed on? And then maybe how would the resourcing focus come out of that? So this team needed to start with release efficiency. So maybe the background of the scenario is there's a really heavy backlog of technical debt, a lot of things that everyone knows low-hanging fruit and that, that could be fixed, um, but there might be very rare, if to none, releases around making changes in those fixes. So there's a lot of confidence lost. There really isn't an expectation for success. <clears throat> there isn't a lot of uh, predictability around the releasing. Um, and so what this team wanted to do was to really focus on release efficiency up front, gain the credibility um, of their constituency by providing really predictable releases and having stuff get delivered, regardless how big or small it was. Even though it was a bit rear view mirror, even though it was stuff that has been lingering for a long time, the point was to dig out a bit, show that there can be done, um, that there could be progress with consistency and really establish what it looks like to go from you know, an inception of an idea, having a good, clear articulation of a solution. Um, because a lot of times if you're in this situation, um, maybe you're doing user stories and creating that value proposition in retrospect, you know, in a, in a retroactive way. 
So making sure that you've kind of got things from design to deployment and that there's an understanding of how things go from left to right in that way. Okay, so that was the first focus of the team. Let's say you're a new product manager and everyone goes, okay, you're here to solve all the problems. Now we have a product manager. Now everything's going to be fixed. Well, you'll be in this position where you say, well, geez, uh, I know that it's pretty misunderstood sometimes what a product manager does, but I'm not the first one to make sure that like releases go well. I mean, I don't, I can't even conduct a release um, maybe with my access, you know, I'm not an engineer. So you'll get in all these little, you know, misunderstandings of what you could what you could succeed on. And so you might realize that, uh, okay, I can do one of two things. I can hire more product managers because I'm drowning in all of the work that's here, but we'll just continue to write more user stories, but we won't get anything through. Or you could come to the realization that you should, which is that actually development and even developers that have a good, strong understanding of development operations, like DevOps type of thinkers, are really your primary focus as a product management leader. So you need to be advocating for engineering resources at this time and not really uh, worrying so much about growing your product team. Even if you feel this unnecessary pressure uh, because you have a title that makes you feel like you should have a big product team. Okay, so then that's all fine and good. And maybe you focus there, then you move into a scale a scaling type of situation, right? What's the structure? Okay, great. So we dug ourselves out. Now the next thing on the roadmap, you know, is really around structuring for scale because this is really a platform that needs to serve 10x the amount of people that it did last year. By next year, um, we're really growing globally and there's a lot of international requirements and there's this, you know, um, this misunderstanding around really what the journeys are, like who, who does use which product features and all that. So now you're in this more kind of storming phase of that, and that's a great place to be. And you know that, so you've set up an epic of what we're going to do is we're going to structure for scale. And so you've got all these activities and, and features and things that are really going to help you understand that. But you also have activities that aren't features at all, right? You need, you need to have discovery. So... Uh, the way to answer to that from a resourcing perspective is UX research is a role that you will need. You'll need somebody that can really in a qualitatively, you know, effective way have interviews with existing customers and understand how they really came to use the product and how they continue to use the product. Um, maybe now is a good time to have a new appointed PM lead that can really focus on kind of the next wave of this, you know, to help you delegate things on. So as you continue to, to improve the, the broader team and a group of products. And then, of course, you need a little bit more development because now you're really going to start doing some fundamental uh, changes to, to the code base. You know, and then we go into the next step, maybe where the next uh, epic would be customer experience, the journey redesign. Okay, so we've got a lot of learnings. We have a lot of understandings of what maybe the journeys are. Uh, but we need to say, okay, so that's the existing state, current state, let's test out a future state, right? So this has a lot of focus around um, <clears throat> prototyping and testing and trying improvements and proposed improvements and doing that in the right way and making sure that they stick from a quantitative perspective. So releasing that and checking it against a broader user base and a higher quantity than, of course, you're kind of one-to-one -one interviews or things that you might have been doing. So the focus there and resourcing is really around data science. It's really around your UX designer, people that can create um, kind of low weight, real quick uh, items to then help support maybe like a front-end developer um, making a prototype that we could deliver that's a little lightweight and just check it before we really invest the time. And then finally, uh, what this team wanted to do was focus on operational efficiency. So now the organization is scaling. It's at a point where pretty much, you know, the checks aren't blank anymore. They're starting to optimize their spending. And so then you start to uh, say, how am I a part of this conversation around efficiency and how we're making the best of what we have? And so you might be wanting to focus now on time to market by optimizing the activities from product development and also the inbound and outbound activities. So that would be the things you ingest to create good product deliverables, which might be requirements from you know contingent teams like your designers, et cetera, or the out the outbound. So when you release the launching, the localization, you know, the proliferation of the stuff that you launch. 
um, and how that's managed. So, for example, this team, considering it's more of a digital team, is really focused on hiring or having hired somewhere else in New York, localization management, and then within the product team, maybe a product operations manager that can really um, do a better job of, of tweaking and tuning in the operational side. So this might be a very rough, quick sketch, but the idea is think of it as kind of two slices along this timeline of your of your roadmap. Maybe you have multiple swim lanes, maybe you have categories that are much cooler than what we have here. But um, yeah, so here are like four categories. You really want to line up these dev, this ops-focused dev, your senior PM, UX researcher, all this together. As you can notice, none of them really have an opinion a hard opinion on them all being part of my team as a product leader or your team as a product leader. That's the most important part of this is make sure that you're showing how it's all just required for a successful product roadmap that has already been described and talked about as being something very um, key to the business. And if you can align it this way, then you're always telling the story through the lens of a product roadmap which I think always makes resourcing a much more meaningful conversation. And it also gets people to buy in and say yes to the right answer uh, based on the scenario and the product roadmap. And then being open to coming up and getting through challenges, which honestly organizational change is so challenging because it really, it deals with egos, it deals with the historical stuff. I mean, it's just before you get to that state, everybody kind of feeling that it's an appropriate set of resourcing plans, you know, uh, first. That's, I think, what is a best outcome from uh, looking at resourcing this way. How does it help recruitment? Um, that's another really, from my experience, I, I do want to share that um, I, I found recruitment to be just so much more successful when I, when I think of hiring through um, a product roadmap lens. And so, for example, the partnership with recruiters themselves. So you might have a recruiter that's completely aligned with the product org, and that means that they do understand product management hiring, but do they really understand your product line? Do they really understand your driving force? And the good thing is since they understand product or they understand your space, oftentimes they really understand the artifacts and the things that you work through like a product roadmap. Telling that story of resourcing on a long-term point of view really helps them find the right candidate because they can tell that story in a meaningful way and they can listen to uh, you know, a selected candidate and really think, do they really fit you know, the story arc? And I think oftentimes the recruiters are flying a bit blind there because we don't let them in enough on the product roadmap itself because it doesn't feel as pertinent to just saying, we need a product manager with XYZ experience. What's great there too is recruiters work with each other as well. So it really helps you expose that there are other recruitment activities happening maybe outside of their focus because many recruiters are focused on different parts of the organization. And so they can collaborate a bit more with understanding with um, that the, the focus, the dotted line I mentioned before, there's dedication from maybe let's say the data science team for against your product line and still a piece of your puzzle. And I do, I do see that they collaborate a bit more. And it gives continuity around the multiple roles as well. When you're going back maybe one quarter to the next and working through um, hiring for multiple roles as you grow, you really have that recruiter understanding the full story just like you did that's longer than quarter to quarter, but for maybe a longer term. Uh, it helps you with initial screening. I mean, typically, at least in my experience, talk to a product manager for 30 minutes um, to start before I realize do I want to talk, have them talk with the team and talk with cross-functional partners. So giving that context and anchoring them to the product roadmap as you describe um, their role, then they can really have a good dialogue with you and understand what they're talking about to you. I, I do find, I mean, I've been on the other side of the fence. I think that we could all uh, understand what it's like to be a product manager asking about a role with a recruiter and then maybe a hiring manager and feeling like 30 minutes is a really quick amount of time if you don't tell me how my role is you know, pertinent to the, to the overall roadmap. So it does help with that. And then with scenario-based interviews, um, and I'm not saying it happens every time, but most places that I've interviewed uh, or been interviewing, 
there are uh, scenario-based, use case, technical, whatever uh, stage you want to call it, interviews. And frankly, that's very hard because they're flying, you know, into those interviews with a really, a really light set of assumptions that the, it's hard for them to know really what's going on uh, in, the, in the broader product space. And so they don't do as well um, when they give a case interview response. And also the teams, if you're doing product hiring right, I think that you have the people that do the that conduct the interviews be cross-functional partners that live outside of the product org. And that means that they need to understand their role in it as well. And so if you've gone through the bouts that I mentioned previous in this webinar, where you've really got people to understand what a well-functioning team looks like inside and outside the product org, the, the bigger family that it takes, right? It takes this, this village to, to move the needle on the things you're trying to do. They understand that space. They understand the roadmap, the story arc of it, and then how this resource fits in it. Then they can really ask pressing questions that make them understand whether or not they can work effectively with this person and if it fits that. And I do think that that's a shortcoming often is the cross-functional case interview uh, stage. If there isn't a good context um, to the, the product roadmap, I see that falling short quite often. All right, and then the final point I wanted to touch on was the operational excellence piece. So smooth operations in product um, and these dependency groups that, that you all have to deal with as product managers is, an, is absolutely key to success. And I think it can be one of the biggest frustrations that every product manager has to deal with because, again, they're influencing without completely owning uh, a relationship. I mean, you don't own people no matter what, but even from an organization perspective, you don't... You can't tell people what to do. You just have to push and hope that they want to, right? And so some of this comes from uh, the concept of operations because you probably assume that they understand the impact uh, that they might have on your work, A. B, you might also assume that they even understand how their way of working is intertwined with your way of working. And so if you're a process-minded person, you can be very frustrated because you haven't really uh, a place for you to look at uh, how people are working today and then say, this is where it breaks down. This is where we fall short. This is how it happens. So um, instead of having that be frustrating, take the ownership and frankly carve out the time to become more of a process improvement or business process design type thinker. Get out things like Visio or visual diagram software document, even if it's current state, how things work outside of you and through you as a product team, deliver that to the other leaders within the organization, and then propose changes that can make that more uh, smooth. I've been a part of dozens of conversations where no one's ever brought out a diagram, no one's ever really said, hey, this is how we're working today, this is how we should work tomorrow. Instead, it's like, we need this sooner, we need this faster, what you're doing doesn't work. I don't think that people really even have a great way without the right visualization to understand a process flow and a workflow, let alone where they can make improvements to that workflow. So that's something you need to take on yourself as a product leader, even though it really means feeling like you're doing someone else's job. I mean, I can give an example of, for example, translation management. It was somewhere where I would say, uh, you'd hope that there'd just be a team that does a lot of localization and translation and they understand which countries and languages we might serve with the product. Well, what if they don't? What if that's a completely unnurtured area? I mean, you can either complain about it day in and day out, or you can, for a month or two, uh, carve out a portion of your time to become basically a translation expert. And you're, you know, you're documenting the steps of translation, where things are and aren't available and all these things, you'll find yourself there. And that goes back to my first point of the clarity of the role um, that everyone I think really wants when they start in product management role and they get frustrated because it's so flexible and the mini hats and all that. It's really in that ambiguity that you can either choose to be frustrated or you can see it that you are, you're blessed in this role to affect change in places that many can't, as long as you don't have this fear of overstepping. And you're always going to feel like you're overstepping. You're always going to be kind of wiggling in other people's spaces. So either get comfortable with it and just try to make it better 
or maybe uh, reevaluate if product management is best for you because um, I don't think you can get away with not affecting workflow change. So I, I, I really advocate um, for you to, to think about that. And, you know, think about how even if you do want to be a little bit more inward facing and think about just your team, I've never seen a product team, let's say I was a group PM and I had four product managers uh, reporting to me, I've never seen them not become happier, become more successful at their job when I started to help define and work very closely with other leaders to help influence their ways of working and make sure that that was very clear to my team and also make sure that the, they understood that there were steps being taken to improve those ways of working that had direct effect on their day to day. That's really a big part of your role. And a, another part of your role that I think could help you feel less frustrated with having to do so much process work, if that's not your cup of tea, is really do understand that business value, just like typical accounting, everyone focuses on, let's say, the revenue, um, but it's really a net type of exercise. And when you think of net, it also comes with cost. And inefficient business practices are very costly. And so you're still affecting overall, you know, the net benefit of your business by working on efficiency. And the more that you can actually focus, and that's why the product operations manager or a person on your team really having an operational mind and wanting to have that focus, if they, they don't exist for you to delegate that to, then that is absolutely something you need to be doing as a leader, evangelizing the benefits, the business value that's there. Uh, from efficiency, because a lot of people kind of do a means to an end mentality around it and just look for the positive impact outside of that. Might be the KPIs around acquisition or retention or whatever it is, you know, CSAT scores, you know, product managers have all these KPIs. I, I don't see very often ones that are around um, the efficiency, the time to market um, from the internal teams and how things go through the flow of from, you know, inception to design to delivery to release. So um, you really need to be a person that's willing to, to advocate for those metrics as well. And it will bite you in the end if you don't anyway, to be honest, because um, I, I mentioned it earlier, an organization goes through a life cycle where it does start to be more of an optimizer than a grower. And um, that's not always a bad thing, but that's, that's probably, as I speak here, more from the lens of, an exponential growing, but a corporate type of company, you really, you, if you hit that place too late and you don't have your head about you on it, then when people do start to talk a lot about efficiency um, and how optimized maybe workflows are, and you don't really haven't been a big player in that, you can find yourself on the wrong side of that conversation. So I, I think it's important for that aspect too. And that's all I had for everyone today. Um, I hope that even though it was a lot about examples um, that I've had from my experience and only three really key takeaways around resourcing, growing, and influencing uh, the formation of a product team and really creating that minimum viable product team and starting and evolving it. Um, I hope that could give you some inspiration to think about how you deal with organizational change with resourcing, with framing uh, a functional product team and understanding that uh, it's, it's a very dynamic world out there and there are many ways to do it, but there are some, uh, some key ways that you can make it easier, make it more meaningful. And um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me at michael at catalystcommunity.llc. And I'm sure that in the chat and uh, somewhere here, you, you'll be able to find my contact information. And thank you so much for the time. It, it's been great talking with you.